Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Welcome to episode nine in the third season of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. Uh, this is the podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalog, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. Today's episode continues our review of side two of the Heartbreakers' monster hit, Damn the Torpedoes, by looking at You Tell Me. If you want to listen to the song before we get started, check out the link in the episode notes and we can dig into it. I don't embed the songs in the episode itself due to licensing issues and out of respect for the Tom Petty estate. In Conversations with Tom Petty, Tom tells Paul Zolo that You Tell Me was the only song that was written during the recording sessions, with the other eight tracks that made the release being pretty much complete before heading into the studio. And amazingly, I can't find a single record of the band ever playing this song live. There were no alternate takes kicking around, and it hasn't been included on any of the compilations to date. I find that quite odd given the, the quality of the song and how good it would have been or how good it could have been as a mid-set palate cleanser live. Following on from Ben Montench's fantastic keyboard performance on Don't Do Me Like That, this song features a nice tinkly piano lick to the, in the intro and plenty more Ben Mont throughout. This wouldn't be accidental sequencing and when Tom and Jimmy would have been sitting down to arrange the track listing, I'm sure that that natural transition coupled with the downshifting gears would have made this the most logical next track. And Ben Mont's piano also sounds very much like a grand piano recorded with lots of natural reverb as it's an expansive tone that fills that middle frequency gloriously when Ben Mont is playing those big fat chords. I'd class this as the longest musical intro to any song on the album at almost 37 seconds. I realise that Louisiana Rain has a much longer intro, but we'll get to that in episode 11. I think you can almost call the first minute of that song a hidden track within a track almost, rather than a, a structural part of the song, but I digress. Uh, to go along with that juicy piano part, which plays mainly on the fourth of every four bars of the intro, you then get that sultry, swampy guitar lick that Mike is playing, which is panned all the way over into the left channel. Tom's rhythm is in the right channel, and again, that's a very simple, steady uh, rhythm part, as it frequently is. And this is the first time on Down the Torpedoes that I've really noticed that they went back to that heavy panning of the guitars, you know, so far over to the left and the right side to sort of mirror where uh, Mike and Tom would be as you were looking at the stage. And again, in the intro, Stan's hitting the hats very, very gently through those first four bars and adding in some light splash symbol in there, which is mixed very carefully to take the attack off of it and just have the wash of that decay of the, of the symbol. And the intro really sets a very visual scene. To me, it feels like a, a humid August night in Gainesville with a streetlight corona trying to battle its way through the, the grimy front window of a dark, bluesy dive bar, most likely with a faulty neon side flashing outside. It's a song that has grit and danger to it. And in that way, the staging and the feel remind me a little of Fooled Again from the debut album. It even has a similar foreboding lyric. However, the tempo and the arrangement of this song cuts along in a very different way from that earlier track and is the work of an already more accomplished songwriter and a more experienced group of studio musicians. And it also has that live off the floor feel to the ryth rhythm of it that comes from it having been written at least partially in the room with the band. It's another tight drum part from Stan Lynch, which just keeps the groove going. But the main heart of this song is the bass line, which is propelled forward with slick, funky inevitability by Duck Dunn. This would be the second time the Heartbreakers would bring Duck into play bass on a track after Hometown Blues from the debut album. And again, you can hear slight differences between the way he plays this track and the way you imagine Ron Blair would have done. Given the fact that they never performed this track live, I wonder if Ron wasn't in the studio when it was being cut and whether he actually ever even learned the part or cared for it. Of all the heartbreakers at that point, he was the one who cared least about you know, fortune and fame and was at least part of the reason why he would leave the band between the next two albums. So I could see it possibly rankling him a little that they brought Duck back in to play this part, or it could just as easily have been that he said, hey, you know who would play the hell out of this track? Duck Dunn. Who knows? There's scant background information available about this track, so maybe we'll never know. But that bass line really walks all over the scales throughout pretty much the entire song. I really like how that bass phrase ends on the one of each following bar and alternates between stepping up and stepping down. It's such a strong foundation to build out the rest of the track from musically. And we get a fantastic big push to start the verses with that switch to E before dropping back down to that root B minor. And the song is pretty much just two chords through that verse and chorus, other than a, a G that we hear for one bar toward the end of the chorus. 
So again, sitting in that groove on a, on a single chord, the bass line has to carry most of the movement and adds a lot of the swagger to this song. We head into the choruses with another big push and we get those beautiful piano trills at the end of the first line, what do you want me to do? And we also hear the organ sort of brought up a little to fill out the body of this section while the bass track backs off a little more to provide a little space for those other instruments before building back into the interlude before the next verse. In those last two bars of the chorus, we also get some nice slides from Mike on the lead guitar, which is brought forward in the mix to add to that, that build and the eventual release of tension. So as we talked about last week, this is another great example of spending some serious time with the arrangement so that each part isn't clashing with another. Through those verses and choruses, Stan isn't doing much on the drums, and again, he's just providing that solid backbone for that delicious bass line to walk all over. It's very in the pocket, it's very subdued, and adding in only very short, simple fills in the transitions between parts. As we head into the bridge, two cool things happen. The first is that Duck Dunn slightly alters that familiar bass line. It's played higher up the neck, and it plays in a little straighter time. And at the same time, Stan goes to double time on the ride and plays some nice little triplets in there before adding a fairly thunderous fill coming out of the bridge and into the solo. The second thing is that wonderful change to F sharp, where that seventh note comes in to give the song an almost sort of bossa nova swing to it. And that's something I'll be really talking about during the Hypnotic Eye uh, season, before dropping back to B minor. You also don't get a push into the bridge, so it's just one more simple thing to differentiate this section from the rest of the song. Such a wonderfully simple, but perfectly placed and executed middle eight. Although it's actually a nine bar bridge, not eight, with that A chord held for two bars at the end instead of one. So again, it just ratchet that tension up for another notch before releasing it into the solo. The chord progression in the solo follows the structure of the verse repeated twice, very simple. The solo itself is very understated and built more around soulful bends and double or triple note phrases, somewhat reminiscent of Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd to my ear. We do get some nice piano from Benmont and again those nice triplets on the ride from Stan. It also features a killer disco bass lick toward the end of the second part of the chorus. So if you go listen out for that around the sort of 318, 319 mark, it's just delightful. We come out of the solo and into that last chorus, which builds a little in terms of the way it's mixed. It's a, it's a little louder. Some of the parts are a little louder and a little fuller. Uh, but the outro sees some really sort of bluesy interplay between the two guitar parts and everything else just drops into more of a, an accompanying space. Although Stan is a little more dynamic through this section and plays off that main bass lick nicely as the sound fades out. Alrighty, it's time for some petty trivia. Last week I asked you who played drums on Tom's third and final solo album, Highway Companion. The answer, which a few of you got online, but a few more didn't, is Tom Petty himself. The album was truly a three-man effort, with Tom playing guitars, drums, harmonica, piano and keyboards, Mike Campbell playing guitars and vibraphone on one song, and Jeff Lynne taking on guitar, bass, keyboards and auto heart responsibilities. I'd love to find footage of Tom playing drums in those sessions because I've never seen any footage of him online playing the tub. So if anyone knows where we could find that, uh, and if you have access to that, that would be absolutely uh, superb if that exists. Um, all three men co-produced the 2006 release, which is also the only Tom Petty release to include no co-written songs. Your question for today is this. Who wrote the book Tom Petty and Me, which focuses primarily on Tom's early career with the Heartbreakers? Okay, back to the song. Lyrically, this song wears its heart on its sleeve and is neither subtle nor ambiguous. It's one of Tom's songs about a dysfunctional relationship, and that first verse has a similar vibe to Stranger in the Night, and thematically, it again reminds me a little of Fooled Again. And those two are very much peas in a lyrical pod in the way that they describe being on the wrong end of an imbalanced power dynamic in, a, in the relationship that the singer is describing. The two lines to finish the chorus, baby, you tell me, honey, you tell me. A really a line being drawn in the sand in an attempt to redress this imbalance. The betrayal reaches its nadir as the bridge crescendos into that payoff line. Yeah, the last thing that I needed was to finally realize that you were lying. Again, a fairly straightforward lyric that isn't hard to parse, but has some good imagery. 
you know, the line, I saw fire, I went left, I went right, describes the confusion that you can feel in this type of relationship. But we also have that slightly cheesy rhyme of pain and rain. It is forgivable, though, as it acts as a sort of a callback and a chorus to that very opening line, Baby, I Heard Thunder. So it just about avoids being a little too cliched. Tom's vocal delivery on this one sits nicely in the middle of both his range and his sort of anger levels. It never reaches the same ferocity as Refugee, but also never drops into the more honey-like tones of Here Comes My Girl. The harmonies through the chorus add a little more depth, and the bridge sees Tom throwing in some pretty great Lennon-esque delivery when he sings Dying and Lying. But for the most part, it's a fairly reserved vocal delivery that again moves the song along, but doesn't take the lead away from that bass line. Okay, folks, that's all for this week. Another episode done. Um, this song for me is all about that glorious, glorious bass line. There are a few songs on this album with good bass parts, and but this one's, I think, probably my favourite. If, if, if it's not the best, it's my favourite. It's also by far the funkiest and the bluesiest, so the bass will almost always take a natural lead in this type of arrangement. It's a great switch of gears from anything else on the album as a song and provides a little respite from the hard-rocking nature of almost all the previous six songs on the record. It's a song that I really like, but I wouldn't put it on the same shelf necessarily as the big hitters from this record or from Tom's wider catalogue. And again, that's just a preference thing. Um, I might be someone's favourite song. I think a couple of people have said online that they love this song, um, and I really, really enjoy it too. And again, especially in the context of the whole album. But it's also arguably the least interesting song lyrically on the record. So for that reason, um, I'll give You Tell Me a solid but not spectacular 7 out of 10. And again, before I wrap things up today, just a reminder that you can support humanitarian efforts in the Ukraine in many different ways, and I would urge you to do so if you have the means. Um, you know, anything, five dollars, ten dollars, you know, would, would go to go some way to helping the situation out there. Um, and I'll keep adding a link to the Red Cross donation page in the episode notes, um, so that you can uh, you can go there and, and donate if you're able to. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. And of course, you can find me on YouTube as always. So go follow, like and subscribe, etc. And please leave a review or a rating or and a rating if you haven't already. Um, the Tom Petty Project is not affiliated with the Tom Petty Estate in any way. And when you're looking for Tom's music, please visit the official YouTube channel first um, to try and find what you're looking for. Uh, and do go to TomPetty.com for official merchandise. Don't forget to check out the Tom Petty Nation and Tom Petty Fans Forever groups on Facebook if you're not already there. They are fantastic groups um, and excellent fan communities to be a part of. Until we meet again next week, keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day. Stay safe and healthy, and I'll be back with you next week to talk about the next track from Damn the Torpedoes, the barn-burningly rocking What Are You Doing In My Life? Bye-bye. <laughs>